All right, welcome uh, to the session regarding adding metadata search to OpenStack Swift. Uh, this will be a talk with my co-presenters, Aaron Rom and Nilesh uh, Bosail, from all of us from IBM. And this was joint work with uh, Paula Dashima and uh, Guy Hayden as well from the uh, Haifa lab of IBM. All right, so the first thing we want to do is go over uh, what is object metadata and uh, why is it useful. Um, the second thing is, is now that you have metadata in your object store, um, how do you search it and how, why are the, what are the use cases and benefits of having such a feature. Um, then uh, we'll have a sort of demo about some work that uh, the team has done and uh, go through some of the implementation parts and future work. All right, so what is metadata? Um, you know, it's metadata, right? I mean, it's pretty generic, but at the same time, uh, in the context of object stores, metadata is now beginning to have a lot more importance. Um, there's user-defined metadata, so this is metadata that users, applications, all of us are adding on to our objects, um, adding on to the system to basically describe what are we putting into, you know, what are, there's hundreds of petabytes now, what, what the hell is it? So that's where a lot of the user metadata comes in. But, you know, if you're a system administrator, system, metas, system metadata is really probably what you spend your time looking at, which is, you know, all the objects came in, what time did they come in, all of the aspects of the system that you might be trolling through to help manage the system in a better way. So I think a key point here is that Metadata is not just something that you might want to throw away and then, you know, the data is the important thing here, right? So the metadata is just as important as the data and you're really building up two sets of data if you think about it this way. Um, there is the structured metadata and so that's the metadata part and it's becoming a structure to all of your big massive unstructured data. And so this structure is something that we're leveraging inside of this talk for metadata search. So, you know, there's a lot of different examples, but um, there's some of the basic things that you and I all know about in terms of, you know, looking at images and all the little metadata on those and our music files and everything else. Um, but a lot of the different scientific areas are now defining their own metadata formats and that they're adding on to their system. And this is also metadata as well. And so all of these structured formats uh, all are providing more structure again to the un massive amounts of unstructured data. And this is something again that we can index and leverage as part of uh, the use of metadata. All right, so um, in Swift, so Swift and object stores in general are becoming a little more unique with respect to metadata. Uh, you know, if you've used file systems, I dare to sort of take a poll about how many people use X adders, right? I mean, it's, you know, a lot of people might sort of know what they are, but how many people have actually set X adders when you're a file application developer? Whereas in object stores today, probably every single person that's written some level of uh, object app has already used metadata on top of those objects to describe it in some way or another. So it is something that is integral into the use of uh, objects. And through Swift, um, you can set user metadata through a variety of different things on the hierarchy. Um, so either at the highest level, which is the account, down at the container, which is built inside of the accounts, or on the objects themselves. Um, and the same thing can happen, uh, you can delete them as well, obviously. Um, system and metadata then is inherent metadata that is just being tracked as part of the system. So when you uploaded the objects and a lot of the other internal aspects of the system. Um, some interesting semantics about how does Swift use metadata. Um, so for accounts and containers, as you add in, uh, just as you add in new objects to a container, you can add in new metadata to that container as well and just keep appending more and more and more of it. Um, with objects though, things work on a whole object basis meaning it's the same concept for metadata. When you add new metadata, you're adding all of the metadata for an object at any one time. So you're not adding additional metadata aspects, you're literally open loading all of the metadata for that object. If you want to update it, then you upload all of the new metadata for that same object. So if you just want to add one object, uh, one piece of metadata, for example, you can read all the old metadata, add in your new object, and then upload it back. Um, 
So there's some semantics around how copy works, and then if you want to retrieve that metadata back, you use the head command on either your account container or object, and that you can view all the metadata for that uh, element. So with a search, well, it is basically as it sounds. Um, the goal here is to, again, take the structure that you're building with all of this metadata and index it, and now provide a really simple, easy way to um, access all of the objects in your system. Um, the goal as well is to provide a REST API for doing all that searching, just like the rest of, of everything uh, in OpenStack, and make it easy to use. Uh, and a, an important point here is that uh, there could be other implementations out there, but actually some version of search is already up and available in the IBM SoftLayer uh, Swift object store. All right, so I've kind of already given a little bit of uh, background on why metadata search is valuable. But, uh, you know, it's really an interesting concept here where, you know, it, it sounds dramatic, but if you have hundreds of petabytes or pet even just petabytes of objects out there and you have no way to really find it, you know, it's almost like the internet where, you know, back in the day we didn't have Google and we would have to index everything and remember where everything was in order to find it. Um, and it's the same thing, you know, with object stores today, to some degree, it's like having a Linux system with all of this file data, but you don't have a find command. I mean, you know, so you have to remember where everything was or you have to somehow, again, provide an index to it in an application external to the system. Um, so the goal here is, again, to have support large object stores, support millions, billions of files, but also now find that, again, that uh, uh, needle in the open stack, if you will. Um, and this can help users, again, with their data and their user metadata, and this can help administrators in terms of how they might want to search uh, uh, the system metadata and the system to manage the system. Um, from use cases, you know, I think that once you have the ability to find what you need quickly, there's a lot of different use cases, and we're going to go through several of them. Um, data mining, data warehousing, um, but effectively saying, I have all of this data, what are the important parts in that they want to analyze? So if I'm using Spark or I'm using any other framework out there, what are the key pieces that I can bring in without having to read in all of the objects and then scan through all the metadata and then eventually find out which are the one important ones that I really want to look at? Um, all right, so I think that's my intro. And Nilesh, take over. Uh, thanks for that, Dean. So uh, as Dean gave an... Uh, background about metadata and what is search meant to the metadata. So we'll go over some of the use cases. Uh, so to start off with, I'll go over a couple of sample use cases to get the uh, understanding with everyone over here. And then we'll go over a couple of real world use cases that we are working with. So uh, in this example, as, as it is shown, it's a advanced photo album wherein users upload their photos and they also tag or put metadata associated with these objects. For in this case, uh, very simplistic metadata added to the on top of the objects like city, the name of the city and then time as day, night and all, all these things. And then we have the search query down there. Get all the objects which has city equal to Rome and time equal to date. So this is a uh, complex query, I mean, in, in some term, that you are having two constraints in the search query, and then it returns back the objects which match uh, to this search query, the, the objects which have the metadata matching to this query. Then another uh, search query over here with time equal to night, and then you get two objects because there are two photos with time equal to night. So this is a very simplistic example. To make it a bit complex, we have uh, we can do complex searches based on uh, date ranges, free text matching, and integer comparison. As it is shown in this particular example, uh, here you are searching uh, in your photos my photo space uh, container or account based on tags like John, Bob, or Alice. So this is kind of a free text matching. So there can be photos uploaded onto the object store, which has, uh, like in Facebook, we do. We tag the photos with the 
the names of the persons in that photo right so you can tag on that and those tags can be internally stored under the object store and you can search based on those tags and you can actually do a free text matching so there can be john dickinson uh, as a full name of that particular person and then you just search on john so it's kind of a substring or free, free text matching you are doing here then you can have dates associated with the photo or the object and then you can do a date range searches wherein here in this example you are searching for uh, objects uploaded or with the date uh, as 212 uh, uh, 2012 and between 2 uh, 3 12 2013 so you are doing all these things and this all these complex searches are also possible uh, with the metadata search apis uh, now we look at some of the real world example as i said right so this comes from rai which is a, a television broadcaster in italy so they put their video files into the object store they have some metadata associated with this but then we are running in some tools within the system to enrich this met metadata. So in this example, we are using Stolets. Stolets is a technology uh, that is open sourced by IBM, uh, contributed to the open source community wherein you can run some engine uh, where the data resides and process on that data. So in this example, we are using a metadata enrichment Stolet, which is looking at this data and actually calculating some kind of loudness value. So in typical video or audio uh, application, there can be different loudness values associated with that object, right? So this is calculating that to the objects which are being uploaded onto the object store and adding that as a metadata for that specific object. And then let's see how this helps in going forward. So you can search for objects with a faulty loudness value, right? Since it is, it is having the enriched metadata, the loudness value associated with that particular object. You can s easily search, give me which are the uh, faulty objects like with loudness less than minus 15 or something like that. And it will give you that. You can uh, do further processing on those objects or whatever you want. But this is how the search capability is really helping you out in this example. Uh, we go on to the another example, another use case wherein we are going to say how metadata search is hel helping you out in terms of analytics or analytics applications. So in this example, uh, as a Swift object store is being used as a backend store for the objects. And then you are doing Hadoop or Spark kind of uh, analytics application on top of this data, wherein you write, uh, you use this Spark SQL, uh, which has the SQL syntax, you run the SQL query give me objects uh, with time frames uh, 8 a.m. to 12 p.m. So you can just get a set of objects and then do further analysis or further processing on top of that. So this is kind of a machine learning algorithm that is running onto your objects and you want to do your further processing only on a subset of the data. Here also uh, this really helps in. So in this particular example, you are using the SQL query and that is internally being translated into the metadata search APIs and search queries and you are getting back the responses, right? It also shows some uh, um, advantage over the time spent and the improvements on that. This is uh, the use case that I was talking about. Just give me uh, the objects with this particular, with the metadata within this range. In the next example, again, uh, this is again a real life scenario. This we are developing with the EMT uh, bus service in Madrid. So in this example, this is the IoT use case. Uh, the search capability allows understanding of the traffic on a particular day at a particular time slot. And that can be used for further analysis and planning for future events. So it happens, so in this example, what it happens is, um, you have the IoT devices mounted on the bus, all the buses that are running on the uh, in Madrid, uh, run by EM, EMT bus service. These IoT devices uh, emit IoT logs and those are forwarded to the IoT servers, centralized servers. And from that server, from the IoT logs, uh, we uh, take out the objects, create objects, put it into object store and also 
uh, associate those objects with some metadata. So some more details on this. So this is how it looks like. The bus services are there. Bus, uh, there are logs like what is the current location of the bus, whether the door is open or closed, uh, what is the current time. All these things are uh, generated by these devices and stored into the central server. Then from these logs, IoT logs, again some store let runs into the object store that takes pieces of these object logs, uh, of these IoT logs and create objects out of it. So you are continuously coming in ob uh, IoT logs, then you uh, make chunks of these logs and store those as objects. And on that particular chunk, you define some of the metadata that I'll go over. The metadata like what is the start time of this bus trip section. There, there can be a big bus trip and you chunk it into multiple sections, right? And each section has a start time, each section has an end time and the coordinates like starting uh, coordinate, end coordinate, uh, the geo points as we say. And then we'll go over a demo. So in this demo, what we are going to see uh, is that we have integrated a Google Maps kind of a, uh, application inside a web application, wherein you give the object storage URL and authentication token because authentication token is required for querying the, the, even the metadata based for the metadata search. And then you provide a container in which you have stored the ob objects, the pieces of the IoT logs, right? And here, what we are going to do is we are going to draw a geo bounding box on this map, which will have a geo coordinates top left, bottom uh, right, and that will translate into a search query. And that search query will run behind the scenes and bring back the objects that are matching with that search query. So let me play this demo. Okay, so object URL. Uh, object storage URL, then token and container that are put in here. What it essentially shows is the rich capability that we can uh, have with metadata search. You have data types associated with the metadata and then you can really do the geo bounding box searches, date ranges, timestamp ranges, all these things. Now we are drawing a, a geo bounding box so this is the bounding box and this returns back. So now as you see all these uh, different colored boxes within the big box, these are the search results that you get. Each box represents a, search, uh, a bus section of a bus trip, right? So you see lots of them that are being returned within this time frame, 12 p.m. Now we are reducing that to 9 p.m., 9, 9 a.m now you can see the search results have reduced because you have reduced the time frame again we are ch will change the time frame like 3 am to 5 am this is very early morning and you see there are not many trips that are happening in this particular bounding box uh, again we increase that and you see there are something that is written now you click on to one of these boxes that represents one search result or one object and then we'll see what are the details that are there. So when we click on one of the box, it shows this a section of the bus trip, right? This is the route uh, that was followed by this bus. And if you see, there, there is URL, object URL. So this is the object that is being searched and uh, written back, 0191. And then we'll see what is the data inside this object and what are the headers or what are the metadata. So this is the actual object, the data, which is a chunk of the IoT logs. And then we'll see what is there in the headers that will show, show us the metadata associated with this object. So this is the metadata, the uh, top left, bottom right, the geo points of this particular bus trip and uh, start and end time. And as I said, these were introduced or uh, put on top of the data by using the storelets that are running inside your object store. Well, so 
these are the coordinates based on which we did the search and these are the time frames so that's pretty much on the on the demo side so we'll go get into the implementation details how this is actually implemented behind the scenes i'll invite iran to do that thanks english um let's see it's a mac wait I make it disabled. I'm also very jet lagged, so do bear with me. Thank okay, so let's talk about the behind the scenes of metadata search. So as we as we mentioned, we basically need to cover here two flows. One flow is index the object's metadata, and the other flow is to serve search queries. Um, so let's assume this is the storage sy system input data path. Every storage system has such a data path, which typically ends with some um, storage at the end of it where some data needs to be written to. Now, on the data pass, we place our indexer so that we can intercept requests for either uploads of new objects or updates of metadata. That indexer would asynchronous, what would it do whenever it intercepts an upload, for example, it would copy the metadata out of the request and asynchronously send it to a queue so that the original request can continue the um, input data path as soon as possible and the the information would then would be picked up from an index search cluster so in our case the input data path is the swift proxy pipeline the indexer is a WSGI or swift middleware um, the persistent storage part on the right hand side is the storage swift here we use RabbitMQ for the queue and elastic search for the index search cluster. Um, this is how we index, like on a high level, how we do the indexing. How do we serve um, search requests? So here is the um, output data path, uh, which is in the proxy pipeline. And then we add yet another middleware, which we call the MD search middleware. Uh, whenever a GET request comes in, um, actually, whenever a search query comes in, the, the middleware intercepts the request and synchronously um, routes it to the Elasticsearch cluster, get a response back, and then back to the user. As you can see, the, the storage tier is not involved here in any case. We don't need it. We just need the results from the metadata search, which the information rely, uh, lies in the Elasticsearch cluster. Um, here is a possible overall architecture of the system. So we've got our Swift cluster. It has the proxy nodes up there, it has the storage nodes down there, it has an elastic search at the side, uh, we've got a load balancer up there, so whenever a request comes in, uh, it hits the load balancer, the load balancer routes it to one of the proxies where we have the indexer with Rabbit to do the, um, <coughs> to do the indexing or the search middleware um, for forwarding query requests to the um, elastic search cluster. Um, Let's dive a little bit deeper to the API, um, to the query API. Uh, Nilesh talked about it a little bit, but I'll dive a little, a little deeper. So we see, what we see here is a GET request from the demo of the buses. Um, it's built out of a typical GET request of Swift. You can see there the, um, here's a GET. This is the host name, V1. Uh, currently, Swift has only V1. Then the container, then the account name, and then the container. So the request is targeted at a container. If we had targeted the request at the account level, we would have searched all the objects within all the account, not just the container. Okay? The query itself comes inside the query string of the um, request. So we've got here query equals, and now we're going to look at um, the X object metadata top left, which is the metadata that we're interested in. And we're seeing, and we're searching whether it is in the bounding box, right? So we have here like um, two coordinates. Here is one coordinate. Here is the other coordinate. This defines the bounding box that Nilesh mentioned. And actually, what we want here is all the object whose top left uh, is in that bounding box, but also the bottom right is in the bounding box. This is how we got only the buses we we're interested in. Then again, we have an extra header here called X content search. Uh, which basically tells our middleware to kick in, to intercept the request, forward it to the Elasticsearch cluster, 
and, and that's it. The, there's a, bit, a little bit of redundancy here, uh, the, the query and the query string and the header, but it's an implementation detail. Um, what we can take out from this example is kind of what are the features. So one feature is the multi-criteria. We have here an end between two criterias. Uh, we support various operators. So in this example, we use the in operator, but there's also the other ones. I'll, I'll mention that this one here stands for um, free text search. Um, and we support metadata types. Um, why, why is it important? So that we can use the in operator. The in operator would be um, treated differently when we're talking about um, coordinates rather than we're um, using um, integers, right? So assume that the x made a top left g wasn't um, a set of coordinates, but rather an integer or a string. Then we would have need to um, run something else behind the in operator, right? This is why we want to keep data types inside um, that, that um, defines the values in the metadata um, items. I hope that this uh, point <laughs> went. Um, okay, Dean, I'll let you wrap up. Right. Thanks, Aaron. Um, so that's the system uh, that they've built, and uh, where do we go from here? Um, I think that, uh, you know, first off, object stores is one interesting aspect here, but I think once you're building already a indexed level of metadata, you might want to use it by your other object uh, storage systems as well. So your file system, uh, especially uh, for us, we do a lot of work with the Swift on file project, integrating file and objects into a single system. And in that case, we want to be able to index all of the files as well as the objects in the single system. So we want to make sure that the backend APIs that are being pushed are standardized so that um, whether we use, you know, RabbitMQ and Elasticsearch or, um, you know, customers want to use MongoDB or wherever, that it can all then plug in uh, to the single system. Um, and as well, of course, you know, once you've built a system, you know, being able to visualize the uh, index databases through Kibana and your typical uh, uh, type efforts there as well. Um, of course, there's other things just starting to move um, inside the OpenStack community. Um, there's been some work around uh, notifications inside of Swift, so we would like to integrate with those and uh, see where they fit inside of this architecture. And as well as the OpenStack Searchlight project is just starting. Um, as far as we know, you know, it's built on the same set of tools, Elasticsearch and RabbitMQ, that uh, this prototype is built on, so hopefully there's a lot of nice overlap there. Um, they haven't started, uh, I believe they're starting with Glance and they have uh, Swift in their roadmap. And so that's something where when we get there, um, one of the real benefits here is a standardized search API. So, you know, as uh, Iran mentioned, there's a lot of different aspects there with how the search API works. And, you know, you want, you want to be able to do as, let's say I'm a user, is write an API, you know, that I can use anywhere, right? So I don't have to worry about if it's an integer in one case, I describe it one way, and it's an integer in another project, I describe it another way. So making sure that everything is standardized across that, I think is good for everyone. And so that's something we want to follow on as well. Um, and okay, so how do we get uh, what we've built? Um, we're initially releasing it with IBM Spectrum Scale and uh, the objects part of, of that product. Um, so, and that's going to come in a couple different ways. One is to use it through a virtual appliance that you can sort of try and buy type thing. And another one is we have a white paper uh, being released this fall as well. It'll include the code that's required. So this is the middle pieces of middleware that are required. Uh, in the proxy server in order to do the, all the different functions. So that's uh, our current way of delivering it, but again, we want to work with the, uh, the community and make sure we standardize all this stuff and get it out there as well uh, moving forward. So that's, that's everything, so thank you very much. Any, any questions? Oh, yeah, sorry, your hands up. You want to wait for Mike or yell? <laughs> Do you guys want to stand? Okay. Uh, have you given any thought to, for example, th there could be, take an object, uh, say a, um, a piece of a map, 
and one app could be adding metadata that says, uh, here's, here's where the water flows, here's where the water pipe goes. And the other could be, um, uh, here's where the roads are. And the third could be, uh, here's where the IEDs have exploded, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Um, any thought on customizing the uh, search engines so that it doesn't index every piece of metadata that it sees, but only builds indexes for certain pieces of metadata that I'm interested in. Right, right. Yeah, I think that you need to build your custom schema for uh, specific types anyways. So, you know, the more efficiency on how you do that, I think will give better results. Um, do you have anything to add? Yeah. Um, so, during the work that we've done with RAI, um, the, the Italian broadcaster, um, so they were using like really complex um, schemas to describe their metadata. And part of that was which metadata to index and whatnot. So, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. And any other questions? Yes. Hey guys, it's really great. Uh, we work on the Searchlight project, so Perfect. come to our session. And we do, we have Nova servers, glance images, and designate data now. And it's a very similar architecture, so we want to work with you for sure. Thanks. That sounds great. Thanks. Any, anything else? Yes, over there. <laughs> Here, maybe just wait a second. He's almost at you. We'll get it on the video as well. I mean, you, you talked about uh, standardizing the interfaces, right? And uh, I forgot uh, some of the earlier presenters talked about some of the storelet functionality that's you know done to extract the metadata. Yes. So are you kind of standardizing the storelet functionality, or what exactly you know are you planning to standardize? Yeah, so just a quick comment, and Aaron can speak, but there's actually a session on storelets on, on Thursday, Thursday morning. I don't remember the exact hour, I think nine or so. So, so storelets, I'll mention it in the talk, but storelets provide you a complementary functionality where the metadata search can help you narrow down the number of objects you actually need to look at, and then you can use storelets to do the actual um, computation over those objects. I'll, I'll talk about it on Thursday. Um, here, the storelets were used for just extracting more metadata, right? So it's a different path. Okay. Yeah, oh. go ahead. <coughs> Sorry. So as Iran mentioned, storelets can be used in uh, multiple ways. Uh, you can uh, use storelets for analyzing uh, based on the metadata, or you can use storelets for enriching the metadata. So one of the example over here, w it was shown that storelets uh, are used to add some more metadata on top of the objects that you have, right? So storelets is not the only way. So you can have your custom tools to enrich the metadata. Storelet is just happens to be one of the way, right? Yeah, it's actually an important point that we didn't really mention before is that this is all built upon Swift metadata. Um, but Swift metadata, you know, is set through either users actually explicitly setting the metadata or it has to get in there one way or another. Um, in the, again, into the scientific communities, a lot of the way that the applications write data it's inherent within the object themselves, right? So the only way that this architecture works today would be is you need that way to extract it and then get it added. So how metadata gets into the system is actually kind of an interesting um, uh, area in the sense that some users might want to set it explicitly, some want to write storelets or other things to extract the metadata, or there might be other ways out there as well where it can somehow get into the system, right, to basically, again, provide that structure. Yes, we talk about the metadata search APIs. Storelets is just another part of it. It's not really tightly coupled. Yes. Um, does Swift's eventual consistency model present any challenges in terms of representing the current state of, of what's in Swift? Well, as a, you know, the current architecture in terms of the Swift, uh, uh, the elastic search part is also eventual consistent as well in this end because it's asynchronously updating the system. So. It does present challenges in, I would say, the, for example, the Spark example, right? Where, let's say you literally just loaded the objects and now you're just searching for your objects and now you want to analyze them. It is possible that they haven't actually been written yet. So, you know, 
because of the asynchronous nature, everything is happening independently and you know how all that stuff comes up. So yeah, right now it's all happening independently and therefore in fact you could end up with a search result that gave you an object that you're still waiting for it to actually appear in the system. So it is it is possible. But uh, you know, I think the key here I think is more of unobtrusive indexing. And so, you know, if you want to be a little more obtrusive, you could do it synchronously. Yes, so, uh, is, is there the possibility um, to kind of be permanently out of sync? Like, so let's say you get two creates and two, two deletes. And, you know, how do you know who actually won those races? With respect to the uh, inside the object store or yeah. inside the, the actual indexing okay. part? So how do you ensure that the current state of the object store is like the the permanent final state right. is accurately reflected in the <coughs> metadata in the in the Elasticsearch. So Elasticsearch is a distributed uh, NoSQL database. It's real near near time, so it it maintains the state across the cluster. So you can have multiple nodes in the Elasticsearch cluster doing uh, maintaining the indexed data, uh, and it maintains the state across the cluster. So even if you, uh, as in the example it was shown, Elasticsearch cluster was uh, outside of the the Swift cluster, right? You can have it on on top of the Swift cluster as well, but it was outside, and uh, it maintains its own state. So when objects are being uploaded via multiple proxy server nodes, there can be eventual incons. There will be eventual eventually consistent, but there can be inconsistency in in between time. But when you uh, upload an object from server B and you try to search on server A. Right. Even if the object is currently not synced up, it will get to the in search database, which is kind of in sync, and it will return you the results. But in, in certain cases, it can happen that you, you got the results, but the object is not there on that particular system right now. Just a specific point, though, to your question. The, the proxy server is timestamping the objects as they come in, and Swift uh, consistency says that the last time slot wins. And so you can then do the same thing back to the yeah, we need yeah. to make sure that the that the Elasticsearch cluster is in sync with that, right. with those timestamps. So yeah, this is a challenge we need to work with them on. Uh, any other questions, or I might be near the time? Okay, great. Thank you very much. <laughs>